Welcome back again, CHP listeners all around the world. Laszlo Montgomery here with you once again, this time bringing you the grand finale of this series covering the history of Taiwan. Over the past nine and a half hours, spread out over 14 episodes, we looked at Taiwan's history from the prehistory of the indigenous Austronesian people living throughout this island paradise with all its earthquakes and typhoons. And we took the story all the way up to the presidential administration of Ma ying in the last episode. And over the past several episodes in particular, I've tried to offer you a general intro to the two main political parties in Taiwan's government and where both of them stand on some of the key issues. Despite the generalizations here and there, I hope you're at least getting a flavor for the differences between the two coalitions, the blue and the green. The Pan Blues, the Fan Lang Lian Meng, besides the KMT who comprise the majority of that coalition, there's the People's First Party, the New Party, and Nonpartisan Solidarity Union. We know where the KMT stands on many issues, and those aligned with the Pan Blues today might think the status quo works best for Taiwan. The Pan Green Coalition, the Fan Liu Lian Meng, Now, we've looked at their early struggles and rise. They have a few points of contention with the Pan Blues. As we saw last episode, the KMT has tried to make amends for their past atrocities and injustices. But there remains a chasm between the Blues and the Greens over how much more the KMT should be held accountable for all the hell they wrought for so many and for so long. Even 228, after the compensation and the apologies... The matter is still not over in the eyes of many Greens. Too many of those responsible got handed a pass. Same with the past interpretation of the history of Taiwan and the details regarding that history since World War II. There's disagreement on these points, too. But I suppose in most countries who still cling to this least bad form of government, it's pretty much the same. We have Democrats and Republicans here, and liberal and labor parties in Australia. It takes forever to get things done in this system, but Taiwan, after decades of Kuomintang meatloaf every night, has taken to democracy quite vigorously. I left you hanging last time with the details surrounding the famous handshake between Xi Jinping and Ma Ying-jeou. That was a heck of a news day. November 7th, 2015. Ogaday Khan, also celebrating birthday number 829 that day. The last time the leaders of the CCP and KMT met face-to-face was in Chongqing right after World War II. Right on Double Ten Day, 1945. Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek toasted each other, though what they both felt inside, we don't know, but could probably guess. That was the fateful meeting the Americans forced on the two sides. Still... Angling for that shotgun marriage that wasn't going to happen, not in the lifetimes of the participants. Ambassador Patrick Hurley flew down to Chongqing with Mao and Zhou Enlai. And then 15 nanoseconds after the Americans left, the two sides were at each other's throats and we know what happened. And now, 70 years later in 2015, the successors to these past leaders got to meet face-to-face in Singapore. So for anyone who... Enjoyed a little political theater once in a while. This was quite a big deal. The general feeling was that, seven years into the Ma ying presidency, things were now rosy enough to maybe turn the heat up a notch, calm the seas more, and take advantage of the momentum that had been gained in friendly or cross-strait relations. Everything about this meeting was meticulously orchestrated. To get around the whole non-recognition thing, they called each other Mr. rather than President, Mr. Xi and Mr. Ma. President Xi Jinping arrived the day before on November 6th after a stopover in Vietnam. President Ma flew from Songshan Airport in Taipei to Singapore, escorted by the ROC Air Force. Ma and his entourage were whisked to the Singapore Four Seasons. Xi was staying at the Shangri-La, where... The meeting was set to take place, both leaders showing exquisite taste in their hotel accommodations. 3 p.m. on November 7th, they met at the Shangri-La. Then came the big photo op of the two leaders shaking hands. No one forgot to take their lens cap off for that shot. And then they both gave short speeches with CCTV not broadcasting the remarks from President Ma, or shall I say, Ma Xiansheng. 
20 minutes later, Xi Jinping and Ma Yingzhou were locked up in a room having their tete-a-tete. And when it was all over, there were smiles all around at their respective press conferences. And one of the things both of them talked up quite a bit was the centrality of the 1992 consensus. Then they had a nice dinner together, split the check, exchanged gifts, and that was that. They both went their separate ways. You'd think everyone would shrug and say, well, eh, this was all nice to see, getting along with China, lighten the tension. But the reality mm, was far from that. Many indeed saw no harm in this policy of engagement with China across a broad range of issues. They were all in. Many world leaders had spoken up positively about the meeting as peace on both sides of the Taiwan Strait lowered everyone's stress around the world. But not everybody was happy about this whole thing. And even before Ma's flight took off from Songshan Airport, he had received a lot of flack. And it was the current president of Taiwan, Madam Tsai Ing-wen, who led the charge, speaking out against the whole idea of this meeting. Aside from all the security and sovereignty considerations, opponents to this meeting decried the secrecy and lack of transparency in what the two leaders discussed behind closed doors at the Singapore Shangri-La. And that in Ma's case, whatever he agreed to should have been discussed with legislators first. So the Pan Greens painted Ma as a traitor to the country for getting all chummy with Xi Jinping. Plenty of scorn was heaped on him for well, in their eyes at least, for selling Taiwan down the river. But they also nailed Ma Yingzhou for what they called a huge political stunt, timing the meeting with Xi so close to the 2016 elections, a mere two months away. Something this high profile, a meeting with Xi Jinping, was bound to give the KMT a nice bump in the polls. However, despite all the hoopla and applause surrounding the historic meeting in Singapore in November 2015, The Taiwanese voters spoke, and the KMT managed to lose the 2016 election, signaling some popular displeasure, perhaps, about how that all played out. And this election only garnered a 66% turnout, which said a lot about voter apathy about the issues. And Taiwan's GDP average growth during Ma's time in office was only around 2.5%. So no one could say all this economic engagement with China gave a boost to the Taiwan economy. In fact, the overall lackluster economic performance during the KMT's eight years in power probably contributed most to what happened in 2016. In these combined elections of 2016, up for grabs was the presidency, vice presidency, and all 113 members of the legislative yuan. In other words, everything nationally. Tsai Ing-wen ran against Eric Chu of the KMT, and again, James Song ran as his People's First Party candidate. And Tsai Ing-wen won with 56.1% of the vote. And for the first time, the DPP flipped a few KMT strongholds, taking more than half the seats in the legislature, which meant they grabbed control of the government away from the KMT. Imagine how the leaders in China felt about that. That was quite a cold shower after this eight-year era of good feeling enjoyed during Ma Yingzhou's presidency. And as I mentioned, as far as the DPP was concerned, they were not at all supporters of the 1992 consensus that was so central to the Xi Ma meeting. And going back to Chen Shui-bian's time, all those hints at independence, changing the passports and postage stamps to say Taiwan instead of the ROC, and and conducting these polls that clearly indicated the vast majority of the public believed Taiwan was its own country, despite all the complications that were well known to all. And to show everyone how they felt about this and everything Chen Shui-bian had publicly stated, at the third session of the 10th National People's Congress, the anti-secession law had been passed on March 14, 2005. And this is where China came out and said, in Article 8, that they would use force in the event of any attempts made at Taiwan independence. The DPP continued to press on. In fact, in August of 2011, Tsai Ing-wen, who never said she accepted the 1992 consensus, had proposed her own Taiwan Gongshi, or Taiwan consensus, that differed greatly from the 1992 version that Xi Jinping held up as the model. And not agreeing to the 1992 consensus was 
tantamount to rejecting the one China policy, and by extension, calling for Taiwan independence, the two holiest of holies. Nonetheless, she wasn't shy about stating that as far as this 1992 consensus went, there was no such consensus among the Taiwanese people. And Tsai had also led the charge in pushing back against the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, the ECFA, one of the hallmarks of the Ma Ying-jeou presidency. One of her arguments was, why go through all these diplomatic gymnastics? Just handle this matter like two normal countries handled it, through the WTO. They were both members. So let's stop for a moment and take a look at Tsai Ing-wen, the first female president of the ROC, first unmarried person to become president, first person of Hakka ancestry, and a little Paiwan tribal blood as well on her grandmother's side. After a very elite upbringing, studying at the finest academic institutions, she began her political rise in 2000 during the Chen Shui-bian years as chair of the MAC, or Mainland Affairs Council. This is Taiwan's version of China's Taiwan Affairs Office. In 2006, she became vice president of the executive yuan, and in 2008, she rose to the top of the DPP. As party chair during the Ma ying years, as I mentioned, she kept up regular pressure and remained a fly in his ointment as far as his PRC engagement policy went. Plenty of sparks flew between these two over some of the most contentious issues. As chair of the DPP, Tsai Ing-wen promoted a very Taiwan-centric policy. And this age-old struggle went back to the Japanese period when Taiwanese people, after a couple centuries of cultural and political development, saw their way of life being paved over by their colonial masters. And we saw in previous episodes how some dissidents showed defiance in the face of such overwhelming force to preserve their nascent Taiwanese identity. Now it was 2016, and there were 23 and a half million people living on Taiwan, only a million or so less than the great nation of Australia. And we've seen throughout these episodes how Taiwanese people had to grit their teeth and survive all those years of martial law and all the unpleasantness associated with living under a strict authoritarian regime. We looked at all these early martyrs of the 1960s and 70s who fought one-party rule and walked into the KMT buzzsaw, daring to defy Chiang Kai-shek and Jing Kuo as well. But their sacrifices and forcing these issues out into the open did ultimately affect change. And when Jiang Jing Kuo reached his dying days and after the end of martial law, the Taiwan we recognize today began to take form. The whole reason Chiang Kai-shek didn't want any opposition parties was because he didn't want any opposition to get in his way. And what started happening in the 1990s was exactly what he tried to prevent. And he killed and imprisoned a lot of people to keep it from happening. But it happened. And now with Tsai Ing-wen and a DPP-controlled legislature in power, all the heated debate and nervous tension regarding the situation in the Taiwan Strait, began running hotter than seemingly ever before. I mentioned last time how each president had their pet phrase to describe the Taiwan-China relationship. Well, in May 2010, Tsai Ing-wen first called the ROC, quote, a government in exile and not native to Taiwan, end quote. Then five months later, she walked the statement back and said, quote, the ROC is Taiwan and Taiwan is the ROC. And the current ROC government is no longer ruled by a non-native political power. End quote. Since she became president, it's no secret that Tsai Ing-wen has put a great deal of effort into boosting Taiwan's international standing. And this is in spite of the potent efforts of the PRC to isolate Taiwan and break the will of any sovereign state wishing to carry out official or even unofficial relations with the ROC. And just like this Central American trip that will already have taken place by the time this episode is released, Tsai Ing-wen has gone all out to engage with other nations and to promote a robust economic policy following the relatively lackluster years of her predecessor. The centerpiece of her administration's efforts at engagement and boosting the economy is the new southbound policy, the Xin Nan Xiang Zheng 
This was a policy of intense cooperation and exchanges with 18 nations in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Australia and New Zealand. It was launched during her first year in office. In addition to this policy, President Tsai has been particularly proactive about developing ties with Japan, Australia, and the U.S. Among the stated goals of these three partners, besides more cooperation in trade, agriculture and new technologies, medicine, education and tourism, is a free and open Indo-Pacific. On the domestic front, many people heralded Taiwan's progressive chops when on May 24, 2019, a constitutional court ruled same-sex marriages were legal. Taiwan became the first in Asia to recognize same-sex marriages. And last I checked, this is not a very long list. Not yet, anyway. Over 200,000 people turned out at the last Taiwan Tongzhi Youxing, the Taiwan Pride Parade. And that's been going on for 22 years already. So Tsai Ing-wen got okay grades where social progress was concerned. She's also trying to lessen Taiwan's reliance on nuclear energy, which stands at about... 15-16% of power generation on the island. And following Chen Shui-bian's eight years, Tsai has been given credit for mopping up the image and effectiveness of the Democratic Progressive Party. And like your <clears throat> humble narrator, President Tsai has two cats and a hair is quite the ilorophile. And if you follow Taiwan local news, she speaks out for all animals and pets, often promoting humane treatment for these creatures who support neither the KMT nor the DPP. The Taiwan economy also, after years of ho-hum growth, by 2019 was standing on a lot more firmer ground. And when COVID shocked the world, Taiwan was applauded early on for its handling of the pandemic, adopting a zero-COVID policy, enacting tight border controls, quarantines, contact tracing, masks. Everything that we learned later on was key to managing the outbreaks when and where they happened. But like most other countries, Taiwan got slammed by the Delta and Omicron variants. You might remember President Tsai got on the horn with President Trump in December 2016 to congratulate him on his victory. (laughs) Plenty of eyebrows raised when that happened. Mine too. Last time you saw the president of the ROC talking on the phone to a U.S. president, was back in 1979 with James Earl Carter and Jiang Qingguo. Before we get to the matter of cross-strait relations, let's take a hard right turn and talk about U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. In a nutshell, Taiwan gets all its serious arms and weapons from the U.S. Other countries supply Taiwan with military equipment, but because of the grave diplomatic consequences, not many dare to engage in arms sales with Taiwan. If the United States stopped supplying arms to Taiwan, they'd have to rely on their own homegrown military industrial complex to defend themselves in the event of any kind of invasion scenario. China and the United States have a lot of things they disagree on, and one of the core disputes concerns American arms sales to Taiwan. If China's negotiators in 1979 only knew back then what they know today, they might have been a little more forceful in their demands to limit arms sales. Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping, both unable to predict the future, seem to have reached an understanding that future arms sales to Taiwan would only be defensive in nature, which arguably they were, and that it was best to wait and see and leave this matter to future leaders to decide. How optimistic everyone was back in 1979. If you recall from part 13 of this series, right after normalization of relations with the PRC on January 1st, 1979, Congress enacted the April 10th Taiwan Relations Act. Let me repeat the wording, quote, The Congress finds enactment of the act is necessary to make clear that the U.S. decision to establish relations with the PRC rests upon the expectation that the future of Taiwan will be determined by peaceful means, to consider efforts to determine the future of Taiwan by other means a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific area and of grave concern to the U.S., to provide Taiwan with arms of a defensive character and to maintain the capacity of the U.S. to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or social economic system of the people of Taiwan, end quote. And ever since then... American arms suppliers to Taiwan have 
feasted or went hungry, depending on the ups and downs of each administration and that particular president's China policy. And after so many years, the U.S. government has become quite adept at maneuvering around the obstacle course of ambiguities and loopholes. Of all the arms deals signed between American suppliers and the ROC military, not everything comes to pass. I pulled some numbers to give you an indication how the matter of U.S. arms sales has risen and fallen over the years since the passing of the Taiwan Relations Act. Under Carter, there were sales of about half a billion dollars. And under Reagan, that rose to about $1.6 billion. And if you remember, the China government was fetching so much, the U.S. had to sign the August 17, 1982 communique, the so-called third communique, whereby the U.S. side promised to start reducing arms sales, commensurate with the PRC's level of militarization along the street. Under Bush 41... The $1.6 billion rose to $6.8 billion, including an order for 150 F-16s. And under Clinton, this figure rose to $17.5 billion. More than half of that number went to pay for 200 Patriot missiles, which are not cheap. Same with the four Northrop Grumman E-2 Hawkeye early warning aircraft. And if anyone sold their shares in Lockheed, Northrop, or Boeing before Bush 43 took office, well, they ended up missing out. Arms sales to Taiwan jumped to almost $30 billion, two-thirds of that just for eight submarines and other amphibious equipment and weapons. Under President Obama, the figure dropped to $13.5 billion in arms sales to Taiwan. Donald Trump, despite that congratulatory phone call from Tsai Ing-wen, signed off on only $18 billion. And let me just mention, these figures also include military training and non-lethal weapons. And so far, under President Biden, uh, he ain't sleepy Joe. He's stingy Joe. Only $3.5 billion has been okayed on his watch so far. And just a few weeks before I recorded this episode, I read the U.S. State Department approved $619 million worth of munitions for F-16 fighter jets and missiles that coordinated well with the aircraft, and for missile launchers as well. A nice order for Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. U.S. defense contractors usually don't keep an inventory for a lot of this equipment, so deals that are signed today might not see any deliveries until years into the future, if at all. And as we saw in the earlier episodes and the decades immediately following the Civil War, when diplomatic relations didn't exist yet with the PRC, the U.S. Navy served as a deterrent and prevented China's national goal of unification, or reunification, depending on your preference, And now in our lifetimes, the deterrence continues in the form of arms sales that many analysts scoff won't be able to prevent a military takeover of Taiwan by the PRC. Nonetheless, these arms sales won't make the PLA's task any simpler. And the American position is, and always was, that all these arms sales were in line with the Taiwan Relations Act, and whatever is signed off on by the U.S. government is defensive in nature and only reflects the growing potential threat to Taiwan. The U.S. defense budget was $126 billion under Carter and $800 billion under Biden, and rising, about 3.5% of the GDP. China is now around $300 billion in defense spending, also rising annually, less than 2% of GDP. And what percentage of that combined $1.1 trillion goes to producing weapons? I didn't dig that far. But you can see, as some commentators will tell you, Take the USA out of the equation. It wouldn't be a fair fight if the unthinkable happened. And just for the record, not once did China ever say they were cool with the Taiwan Relations Act. It was as challenging for China to mess with the U.S. Congress back then as it is now. So calling this whole matter of arms sales to Taiwan defensive in nature eh, hardly assuages the anger of those in China who are, eh, you know, trying to bring this whole matter to a head and Put that final piece of the puzzle in place to make everything whole like it once was between 1683 and 1895 and during those tortuous years from 1945 to 1949. Now, before we get to the current state of the art with respect to cross-strait relations, let's first ascend in our hot air balloons as high up as Felix Baumgartner and consider the present in the context of what's been presented during the course of these past 10 hours. 
How could these most ancient Austronesian people living on Taiwan so many thousands of years ago have ever imagined their island home in 2023? The Dutch had the right idea 400 years ago in 1623 when they tried in vain to make that place their own. Such a plum location. A hundred miles off the China coast, the Philippines to the south, the Ryukyus and Japan to the north. Zheng Chenggong felt the same way. During his Zheng family Dongning kingdom of 1661 to 1683, the people living on Taiwan got to enjoy a little self-rule, albeit under an ethnic Han Chinese government, but everyone, or their forebearers at least, had come from China. But this period of self-rule on Taiwan only lasted until 1683. Kangxi listened to Shi Long's exhortations about the criticality of Taiwan to China and put an end to the Dongning Kingdom. And in that same year, Taiwan became a prefecture of Fujian. And then finally, after more than 2,100 years of history going back to the first Qin Emperor, in 1885, Taiwan became a province of China. How shocked all these Ming and Qing era figures would be to see Taiwan today. Around part five of this series, we saw how only 10 years after Taiwan became a province, China was forced to hand the entire island over to Japan as a result of their drubbing in the First Sino Japanese War. And then, starting in part eight, we commenced following the roadmap that ultimately led us to where we are today. We looked at all the events that have cratered the timeline of recent past history, the Cold War containing China, the complications of the Korean War, the First and Second Taiwan Strait Crises, Eisenhower, Chiang Kai-shek, Madam Chiang, Kennedy, and all down the line. So much rancor. And over the past five, six episodes, we hovered over various events in the history of Taiwan that I hope gave you a clearer understanding of, if nothing else, then at least Taiwan's political history. It was my intention in producing this series to offer a panoramic view of Taiwan's history and prehistory. I know this is a little harsh to say, but where I come from, in the United States, the history of Taiwan is almost always framed within the context of whatever's happened since 1949. There were nine episodes that dealt with pre-1949, and over these past six episodes, we've looked at a number of milestone events in Taiwan that took us up to the present day. Since the earliest heartbeats of the People's Republic of China, this matter of unifying Taiwan under the one country, two systems, or one system, if it comes to that, has been held up by every Communist Party chairman going back to Mao, and it's been part and parcel of China's patriotic education for all students from the day they started their schooling. And as of October last year, 2022, the one whose opinion matters most, well, he said it was up to the Chinese people to resolve the Taiwan issue and, hearkening back to the 2005 anti-secession law, he further said that China will never renounce the right to use force, but will strive for a peaceful resolution. Tsai Ing-wen's presidency coincided with all the volatility of the past seven years, which included COVID, the Trump administration's mudslinging, China's constant bullying and wolf warrior diplomacy, the controversies of Hong Kong's 2019 extradition bill and national security law, and what this meant for the one country, two systems prospects for Taiwan. Since Tsai Ing-wen's surprise phone call to Donald Trump in December 2016, there's been a steady stream of public and private figures who have visited the island or spoke out publicly in support of Taiwan on one issue or another. The visit of Speaker Pelosi in 2022 was just the most high profile. And Taiwan's popularity amongst politicians and celebrities hasn't been this high since Nixon's time. And I didn't plan this, but how was I supposed to know back in September, October last year when I began cobbling all this together that President Tsai would be heading in this direction on one of her goodwill visits, this time to Belize and Guatemala. No need to stop off in Tegucigalpa on this tour. Taiwan's now down to 13 countries who still recognize them. On Tsai Ing-wen's watch, 
So far, nine nations have changed their allegiance to the PRC. She's already come and gone to New York and gave her speech at the Hudson Institute, as well as receiving their Global Leadership Award. And then she flew to Belize and Guatemala. And on the return flight to Taiwan, the president's plane landed here in sunny L.A. She gave her speech at the Reagan Presidential Library and did the whole photo op thing with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. And not to be outdone, but Ma Yingzhou, while all this was going on, was visiting China, and in so doing became the first ROC leader to touch down there since that fateful year of 1949. The U.S. government insists President Tsai's visit, it's all in line with Washington's long-term policy of unofficial relations, and that allowing for transits of this kind are taken into consideration for the dignity and safety of the passenger. Remember in part 14 of the series, Bill Clinton was so mean, making Lee Teng Hui spend the night on the tarmac in Honolulu? Anyway, all things being equal, I'm sure this wasn't what Deng Xiaoping had in mind when he put on that cowboy hat back in 1979. I might have to come back before I post this on my CHP feed and do some voiceovers. That's the problem with talking about history that's too current. From the safety of 2023... We could perhaps look back on the eight years of Chen Shui-bian's presidency from 2000 to 2008 and begin to pass judgment and make a number of observations. But these years since Tsai Ing-wen's election in 2016 and re-election in 2020, it's still too early to pass historical judgment. I didn't mention her party suffered a political setback in the 2022 local elections. It was a resounding defeat for the DPP. So resounding, in fact, Tsai Ing-wen resigned as party chairperson. And her term as president will be up next year in 2024. And because the current DPP-led government in Taiwan doesn't agree with the KMT's 1992 consensus, there's no convenient path to work their differences out. If you recall from part 14 of this series, the KMT and CCP negotiators in Hong Kong, despite their profound differences and admitting this political matter has been stuck in the mud since the second Taiwan Strait crisis and remains irresolvable, still in 1992, they were able to reach some sort of formula that worked for both sides, the KMT and CCP. Therefore, to address their budding new relationship and to try and paper over the political differences, they came up with this solution that framed the situation as two opposing political sides working together within the one country framework. The KMT side negotiating not as a second China or as an independent Taiwan. Tsai Ing-wen and her party, the DPP, well, they don't go around screaming this from the rooftops, but... They don't go for the one China policy. So by not accepting that one most sacrosanct point, there's really not much else to talk about. So in winding things down in this Taiwan series that began almost six months ago, I hope it's been useful in helping to frame your historical understanding of the big picture. And I also hope it's provided you with a little context to better sort out the cacophony of voices arguing their opinions about Taiwan and what Taiwan's future should look like, regardless of what the consensus may be among the 23, 24 million Taiwanese people. Most of the feedback, comments, and emails I got from listeners so far, yeah, more or less have said that the history of Taiwan prior to 1949 was a blank spot for them. So if nothing else, I hope that this series was useful in that respect. I hope it filled in a few gaps, maybe a chasm or two. Once again, my thanks to all of you who have been of assistance to me throughout this ordeal. A special shout out to Mr. John Ross at Camphor Press since 2014, publishing great books about Taiwan and East Asia. Camphorpress.com. And thanks to John and Eric Michael Smith of the Formosa Files podcast that I became a fan of these past months. I'm going to put together a long list of links to various sources where you could learn more about Taiwan. I'm going to try and make it to Taipei later this year and scope out some of the places around the island mentioned over these past 15 episodes. I look forward to hanging out with some of you who have written to me and offered to show me around. 
Okay, that's going to be it. New topic coming next time. I thank everyone who lasted all the way to the end. In these troubled times, I know it's a challenge for many of you to support your favorite podcasters. If you'd care to subscribe to my Patreon or to CHP Premium or even make a one-time donation to this long-running family program, go to my website at teacup.media and there's all kinds of ways to support my humble efforts. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the Southland here in the Golden State. Please mark it in your calendar to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.